Welcome everyone back to another one of our lecture series for the National Surgical Teaching Society. Tonight's lecture is going to be on urology. Urology is one of the most common surgical jobs you may get as a foundation doctor. Tonight we will be covering the key conditions and how you may be expected to manage them. Our lecturer this evening is Louise Goldsmith, a urology registrar at Imperial. During her core surgical training in Oxford, she regularly taught medical students and junior doctors and was the chief anatomy demonstrator at the University of Oxford. When delivering teaching and medical education, she always aims to keep the clinical application and relevance at the core of her teaching. So without further ado, over to you, Louise. Thanks, Alice. Um, so I hope everyone can hear me okay. Welcome to the lecture this evening um, and thanks for joining. So as Alice said, I'm a urology registrar working in North West London at the moment and the aim of tonight's lecture is essentially get you guys prepared for what you'll be dealing with, with from a urology perspective as F1s, as new, doc new doctors um, on the ward and on the, the shop floor essentially. The reason it's important is urology is going to crop up in every foundation job you do. Basically, everybody has a bladder and they can go wrong in so many ways that whatever your specialty, you are going to be affected by it. So whether you end up in GP, short term or long term, you're going to have your old men with prostates. If you're working in intensive care in A&E, even if it's not from a urological perspective, you're going to be having to manage catheters for fluid balance because that's going to be important to how you manage patients' physiology. Um, again, in A&E, you'll be having renal traumas, people coming in with possible stones and how to manage that condition. Um, in obstetrics, you'll have bladder injuries when people have emergency caesarean sections and you'll need to manage bladder injuries and the associated complications. And then also with obstetrics, of course, you have the physiological hydronephrosis, your pregnant ladies coming in with um, physiological hydronephrosis, as I said, and how to manage that, when to investigate and when to intervene. And even in paediatrics, you've got your torsions, your undescended testes. Um, so it crops up everywhere. I think it's really good if you have a basic understanding of how to manage the common conditions um, and what you would need to do as an F1 essentially. Um, so the learning objectives today, I'm going to keep it kind of to the core, to the get basics. You're not going to come out of this lecture, you know, as consultant surgeons understanding the minutiae and the fine details, but how to manage the common problems that you will be facing and being um, confronted with as F1s on the, on the ward. Then your kind of common urological procedures and investigations. I'm fully aware that often the urological curriculum is not very well addressed in the undergraduate years and so I think if I can give you hopefully a basic understanding of the common procedures and investigations that will help you navigate your way through urology as an F1 and then just a couple of common presentations that you may um, encounter either in A&E or with acute inpatients how to manage acute testicular pain and also colic and so as I said the aim is going to be to give you a good understanding and knowledge of the common urological issues how to manage them and also when to ask for help. So I've obviously been in both situations as a new F1, you're thinking how to manage this, how do I sort this out, but also when's the appropriate time to call for help, when do I need to escalate this and actually this is out of my hands. And there are some urological procedures and problems that you guys absolutely will already be able to deal with, but there's definitely a few um, that you should be escalating early doors rather than trying to have a go at managing it for a couple of hours and then escalating it. And on my end of the spectrum as a registrar, we want to know about certain problems early on rather than being told after you know the junior doctors having had a go at managing them for a couple of hours we want to know about certain conditions very early on in their presentation so with the common urological problems on the wards that we're going to talk about catheters are going to be the bane of your lives and if you have a good understanding of how to sort them out how to troubleshoot them um, insertion chips and tricks that will get you out of a whole world of problems so we're going to go through that in detail and then also once the catheter is in how you manage it when you take it out um, and a couple of issues that can result after catheterization of a patient and these will be occurring in all of your patients and all spectrums of the hospital so i'm sure you're all aware of your double catheter and this is your two-way catheter three through catheter normally made of silicon sometimes used of latex um, always check with the patient what allergies they have before you place a catheter. Um, just having a look at this, this is your two port catheter. So you can see the 10 mil orange port. That's where you inject your water into and the balloon will inflate. And then you've got the drainage tube. So it's a two, two way catheter because there's two channels, one for the 10 mils for the water and then one for urine to be drained out of. Um, so 
indications for catheterization, you can always break it down into urological and then medical issues. So when you think about your urological indications for catheterization, if somebody comes in with acute retention for whatever reason, you can obviously place a catheter to relieve that. If you think this is somebody that's going to be developing potential retention, so if they're going to be having a long general anaesthetic, when their bladder is going to be paralyzed, you obviously want to place a catheter preoperatively so that you can monitor and drain their bladder during the operation. Um, after surgical procedures, so specific urological procedures, we'll always leave the catheter. So if there's been a join or a hole made or an anastomosis within the bladder to the prostate, we will leave a catheter so that the bladder remains under kind of low pressure and it can heal around the surgical site or after they've had a resection of a bladder tumour, you leave a catheter in to facilitate any drainage of any residual tumour and clots. Um, and then finally, from a medical perspective, you'll be inserting catheters, not from any urological indication, but it will give you, you know, a minute by minute uh, understanding of their urinary output. And then also if you've got somebody who's frail or immobile, either because of, um, you know, orthopedic injuries, you can man manage their continence with a catheter. So there's your medical and your urological reasons for why you need to insert a catheter. As I've said, so size-wise, we typically have 14 French, all the way, sorry, 12 French, all the way up to 24 French. In your standard two-way catheter, which is just to relieve urinary retention or for fluid balance, you would go for a 12 French in a female, and you'd normally use a 14 French in a male. They go up to size 24, which is a seriously chunky catheter, and these are used when you have situations when patients have hematuria, and they need to have a three-way catheter placed, and I'll talk through that in more detail um, shortly. So typically 12 French for a female, 14 French for a male. And it's the same size for each. Often people get het up on whether it's a, catheter, a male catheter or a female catheter. That doesn't exist. It's all the same catheter. It's just the size and the width of the catheter tube itself. When you're placing your catheter, chaperone is key. Do not get you know, dragged into a situation on a night shift when you're by yourself. The nurses are saying you need to catheterize this patient. Take somebody with you and document that. Mainly from a medical legal perspective, boys catheterizing boys, boys catheterizing girls, girls catheterizing boys and girls. Everybody needs to have a chaperone, and you need to document that down and put the name of the patient of the chaperone with you. Um, as I've said, you need to check for allergies for two perspectives. One to check that they're not allergic to the catheter that you're going to be introducing, but also you're going to be um, introducing Instilla gel, and that's got multiple agents. It's got antiseptic, it's got lubricating agents, and it's got a local anaesthetic. And you don't want to convert a simple catheterization into an anaphylactic situation where you have to be putting out, you know, a crash call for an unnecessary reason. So always check allergies before you catheterize a patient. With regards to Instilla gel, it's a, um, a lubricating agent that I'm sure you're all familiar with from medical perspectives. And um, it has, as I said, local anaesthetic, it has lubricating agent, it has a local anaesthetic as well. They come in 11 millimeter tubes because that has been um, calculated to be the average volume of a male urethra. Personally, for a male, I would say that you should always be using two tubes of Instilla gel. So you inject one, then you inject the second. And this is because it will open up the urethra for you. So this is a tip. So always take two tubes of Instilla gel. Um, it will open up the urethra and mean that when you pass your catheter, it's much easier. There's no narrowing and it just kind of makes the natural passage much more dense. You're not going to do any harm by placing too much Instilla gel. Too little will give you problems. Always do a rectal exam in a male and sometimes in a female, there's two reasons why I would suggest you always do a rectal examination. Firstly, you want to check, are they in retention because they have got metastatic or spinal cord compression? So is this a neurological reason, in which case you need to be escalating that. So when you come in and you see your patient, they're in retention. So this is only for patients that are in retention, sorry. Not if they're having <clears throat> um, fluid balance or they, you know, they're well and they just need a catheter for other reasons, but they're in acute retention, you must do a rectal examination because you want to know have they got an appropriate anal tone, anal sensation, because if there's any deficit there, you need to be escalating this up to your registrar or to your SHO at least, because they need to be investigated urgently for a possible um, spinal cord compression, which is a medical emergency. And so what I would suggest you do, place your catheter. You can do that before you do the rectal examination if you want to get them pain-free if they're in acute retention. Um, and when you do the rectal examination, you specifically have to ask the patient when you're placing your finger around the sphincter externally, can you feel this? Does this feel normal? They may say, I've not normally had my 
rectum palpated, but they will be able to feel it or not. And then internally, when you've got your finger inside and you're feeling the prostate, you want to ask them to squeeze your finger with their bottom, okay? If they squeeze it and you've got a good um, contraction, you know they've got appropriate tone and they've not got a neurological deficit. So make sure you always do that. Um, anecdotally, sometimes people say, you know, they've asked the patient to squeeze my finger while they've got the finger in their back passage and they say, I can't reach around and do it. So I always say, squeeze my finger with your bottom. Um, and finally, the foreskin. So always replace the foreskin. Don't ever leave it um, retracted. So you're going to retract it, obviously, when you're cleaning before you perform the catheterization, but ensure that you replace it back. Otherwise, you're going to run into trouble in four, six hours' time when they've got an acute parathymosis that is going to be um, a real issue. Okay. Um, and then finally, document. So the things that you need to document, as I said, chaperone, the indication for why you've catheterized the patient in the first place. Um, if you had any difficulties catheterizing them, you need to document also that you have seeing a flashback of urine before you inject and inf inflate <clears throat> the balloon because that will demonstrate that you have placed the catheter into the right location we'll talk about this more in a little bit and um, say you've had a chaperone say your findings what has drained so the color of it the volume of it um, and any issues and then post-operative care as well post-procedure care as well so things like managing their fluids watching their fluid output as well and if they have any problems um, with the catheter any bleeding afterwards so they can be monitored for that so just talking about basic anatomy when you come to catheterize patient, I'm sure you're all very aware and up to date with your anatomy, but just some basics. So talking about female anatomy, first of all, in an ideal world, a woman's vulva would look like this picture. You'd have your labia, you'd have your nice uh, opening of the urethra and the vaginal opening. You get into it in real life, you've got some lady who's morbidly obese, she can't open her legs, she's very immobile. You need to get a chaperone with you that will help either move the legs apart, and so you've got a good um, exposure to the area that we're going to be catheterizing. And also, a lot of people will have a large uh, apron of fat on their tummy, and you need somebody to lift that out of the way. You, exposure is key. If you are trying to get a catheter in, in the middle of the night with that adequate exposure, it's going to be a nightmare. Other things to talk about with regards to women as they become older and after childbirth and after the menopause, a lot of the um, external genitalia will become atrophied or it can even become much more lax and therefore you think it's going to be really obvious where the urethra is and suddenly you're spending a lot of time trying to catheterize the vagina and you're not getting any urine back. So what my tips would be for this is one, what you can do if you're having trouble finding the urethra is place a finger inside of the vagina and lift up slightly with it, so press towards the patient's front, so up to their belly button with the finger, because that will just very gently <clears throat> lift the anterior wall of the vaginal vault and it will make the urethra more straight and it will make it more apparent. And also if you've occluded the vagina with your finger, you're not gonna put the catheter in there. Um, the second thing to say is, everyone would laugh at this you think you know where the clitoris is the number of times that we get called by consultants from intensive care all the way down to f1s we say what have you been trying to catheterize why are you having problems um, and they've been trying to catheterize the clitoris so just be aware that's where she is and um pay her due respect okay um other things to mention with female catheterization so female genital mutilation is prevalent in the uk population it's not um always completely obvious so if you are struggling to catheterize a woman and you think the anatomy can look looks distorted if you're able to catheterize fantastic you can proceed with catheterization but you must report this to your registrar if you think there is a degree of female genital mutilation do not be embarrassed about this if you don't know what exactly you're looking at because equally as women age and they have a trophic vaginitis as estrogen levels reduce after the menopause Again, the external genitalia will change and they'll become thin and they can become fairly um, atrophied and pale looking. If it doesn't look like normal genitalia to you, just ask somebody. The next day, it's not an emergency, but just let somebody know. And if there's any queries about FGM, that's going to be escalated kind of to safeguarding um, locally. The flip side of this is if you're catheterizing women or younger girls in an A&E setting and you think they may be going home with a catheter if they've come in with retention, but they're going to go home definitely escalate that to your A&E registrar that you're querying um, female genital mutilation because they would obviously implement safeguarding measures before they get them home. So any doubt, just send it up the chain. Okay. So 
With regards to the anatomy for the male, I'm sure you're all aware that the male urethra is much longer, so it's around 25 centimetres, and it's got multiple curvatures and it's got the potential to stretch it down and to narrow. So when you've got your patient lying on the bed and you're going to do your male catheterization, you need to be holding the penis completely perpendicular to the rectum and have the patient completely flat and then you need to lift and straighten the penis as much as you can. They will tolerate it very well. Penises are very malleable organs. And so you really need to straighten out that um, urethra to optimize getting a catheter down. If you leave it kind of not straightened out and not stretched, you're going to have so many um, curves and bends to get around. It's going to make life really difficult for you. So if you just take note of the yellow urethra here on the right hand side of the screen, there is a fairly acute 90 degree angle as the urethra passes from the penile urethra into the prostatic urethra before it enters the prostate. You will probably be familiar with straight catheters. <coughs> Sorry. But we also have something called a curved tip catheter or a cude catheter. And as you can see, the bottom two catheters here have got an angulation to them. It's the same as a normal catheter, it's two way, but it will allow you to navigate through the urethra much easier and if there is a curvature that you're having problems with your straight catheter go and find a curved tip catheter and have a go. I would suggest before you do it by yourself for the first time ask one of your SHOs just to show you how they place a urethral two-way catheter, a curved tip catheter sorry, and with the tip if you have the patient lying down the tip needs to point up towards the nose of the patient not down towards their feet okay so as you place it in it's pointing up it's not pointing down so the curve is going up to 12 o'clock not six o'clock and this can really help you in a tricky situation when you can't catheterize a male so important points with regards to getting your flashback of urine often you've passed your catheter in and you think you're in the right location but you've got no urine draining they have got a full bladder you've convinced they're in um, urinary retention but for some reason there's no urine draining if you were to inflate the balloon when it's actually in the prostate you can see the damage that you're going to do they're going to have significant bleeding they can stretch you down afterwards because you expand the tissue and then it will scar as it heals so you must 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 get a flashback of urine before you inflate that balloon other issues that you may notice when you have the catheter pass so often you pop the catheter in the patient's lying down um, and you don't get an immediate flashback of urine, but you're convinced you're in the right place, it's gone in without any resistance, um, and the urine is just not draining. The first question is, is a large blob of instilla gel sat over the tip of the catheter? So what I would do is I would take a bladder syringe, which are these much longer, larger 50, 60 mil syringes with a nozzle end, <clears throat> fill it with around 40 mils of uh, sterile saline, and you plug it into the end of the catheter and just gently flush it into the bladder. And if there's any debris or if there's any jelly sat over the tip of the catheter it will then be able to drain and you will aspirate urine off with the syringe and you know you're in the right place. The second tip that I would suggest is sometimes you have your patient they're completely flat they haven't got an enormously um, distended bladder but they still need to have the catheter it's gone in and you're still not getting urine back. Sit them up get them to cough get them to squeeze on their lower abdomen you want to increase the intra-abdominal pressure and then you'll often get a flashback of urine coming back down and you know you're in the right place but you must see urine before you inflate so many people you know have been sat catheters in they call somebody because they're not getting urine back they can't work out why you sit the patient up you ask them to cough for you and you get a nice flow of urine okay uh so you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the two-way catheter. You can appreciate it's got two ports, and this is what you're commonly going to be using to catheterize patients. We also have the three-way catheter. And when you look at them from an external perspective, there's not much difference. When you look at them in cross-section, so if we've cut the catheter in half, you can appreciate that the two-way catheter has two channels. So the main large channel is going to be where the urine drains from, whereas the smaller channel on the right-hand side here is what you will inject your 10 mils of saline or water into the balloon um, and that's where that travels up. The difference with a three-way catheter is that there are three channels. So again, the central channel <clears throat> is for drainage of urine. The channel on the right-hand side again is to inflate the balloon, but the channel on the right left-hand side, you can actually introduce irrigation and fluid that will wash out the bladder and then drain out through the internal um, drainage channel. Just to demonstrate that a little bit better, because these will be 
introduced to patients who are suffering with hematuria because when patients come in with clot retention so for whatever reason they've either got a, a kidney cancer they've got a kidney stone or most likely they've got a bladder cancer or a large vascular prostate they've been bleeding into their bladder for some time clots are forming in the bladder and they almost look like thick bits of liver and jelly and you're unable to void them and so therefore they sit over the base of the bladder as they settle down and they inhibit you from passing urine and you'll go into something called clot retention in these situations a three-way catheter is passed because you can then wash the bladder out and suck the um, clots out and then urine can start to drain so this is a very basic bit of art by myself to demonstrate the three-way catheter and irrigation <clears throat> so here you can appreciate that there's a three-way catheter into the bladder with the holes at the tip where you will have irrigation running through and drainage coming out and the balloon is inflated. So this is the irrigation. So you can see that the patient will have the catheter coming out and it will be attached to normally a three, four liter bag of sterile saline, which will go in and you can see the direction that the irrigation is going into the bladder and filling up the bladder. You will then have say blood clots and hematuria that will mix with the irrigation, become more dilute, and then it can drain out the red side of the catheter and it will come out that way. And then your middle channel is just for where you inflate the balloon. So that hopefully when you get onto wards and you see patients with irrigation running and they've got a three-way catheter in, that's actually what's going on inside the patient. And once you've performed a bladder washout, so you'll take your 50 ml bladder syringe again, and you'll gently introduce um, saline or water into the bladder and then you'll draw back on it and big lumps of clot will come out once you've removed all of the clots and this is something that you shouldn't be doing yourselves as f1s in the beginning you should get shown this by your registrars and your shos and then you'll be competent to do it and then you run the irrigation and you can affect how fast or slow the irrigation runs and the aim is to have clear urine draining out so if you've got a lot of bleeding in the bladder and you have very slow irrigation trickling out it will come out looking almost like a red wine you increase and increase the irrigation the rate of it and slowly it will become more like a rosé wine and then eventually you're aiming for nice clear irrigation um, so the suprapubic catheter suprapubic catheter i'm sure you're all familiar with it in concept so if for a variety of reasons the patient can't have a urethral catheter, either they've had urethral trauma, um, they've had pelvic injuries, or they're having long-term catheters, and they would rather have a suprapubic catheter than a urethral catheter, you perform a, you place the, the suprapubic catheter through the lower abdominal wall into the into the bladder, and then urine drains that way. There's some really important contraindications that you need to be aware of. So traditionally. A superior catheter was deemed uh, you know, a junior doctor's job and it would just be a case of, oh, we can't get a urethral catheter in or this patient needs a superior catheter because they're a difficult urethral catheterization. Just let the junior pop or throw an SPC in. That is not the case anymore. So the urological guidance that we receive as registrars and consultants is that a superior catheter should not just be placed on the ward. It needs to be placed under ultrasound guidance because you want to ensure that you're not passing that superior catheter through bowel, through blood vessels, through other structures, and that you've got a clear route into the bladder. And it also needs to be accompanied with, flex with a flexible cystoscopy. So at the same time, you'll have a camera in the bladder so you can confidently say that superior catheter has made it all the way into the bladder. I'm just gonna stop there because I'm not sure if there's some questions or no. No, I think we're all good. No, now. sorry. I was just had a little something just flashed up. Fine. Um, so your super catheter, do not just put one in. Do not be pushed into just putting one in. This should be done by a registrar and above. Apart from being an F1, there are some other oh, stop. contraindications to placing a super catheter that you should be aware of. And while you're not going to be placing the catheter yourself, um, you need to think about this. So if someone has a coagulopathy, either this is iatrogenic, they're on warfarin, they're on antiplatelet agents, or they've got an intrinsic coagulopathy, you do not want to be passing a large needle and a large catheter through the abdomen into the bladder. Their clotting needs to be normalised before it is safe to place a superior catheter. Equally, if this patient has a possible bladder cancer or a known diagnosis of bladder cancer, if you were to place a superior catheter through the abdominal wall into the bladder there is the potential chance that you can spread and seed the bladder cancer back along the um, superior tract through the abdominal wall through the um, you know the pelvic um, 
contents and therefore you would convert a patient who maybe had um, localised bladder cancer into metastatic cancer as that cancer would spread along outside of the bladder that was containing it previously. So if they've got haematuria, they're currently being investigated for a possible bladder cancer or they've got a known history of bladder cancer, no for an SPC. Equally, if they've had a history of lower abdominal surgery, the reason that it is a contraindication and definitely a contraindication without ultrasound guidance is they may well have ad adhesions to their anterior abdominal wall and if you have an adhesion there may be bowel involved in that adhesion and therefore when you go through with your um, needle in your superior catheter you will not only be going through some fat and some skin into the bladder you could be effectively passing your needle through their bowel and this could you know potentially lead to small bowel obstruction large bowel obstruction a perforation and you could be sending this person to death when you can send a patient for a superior catheter they quote one percent risk of mortality and morbidity because if a frail person who is a typical person who needs an SPC um, requires you know, a laparotomy because they've had a bowel injury during this procedure, there's a very high chance of them dying. So final contraindication is so if they have abdominal wall cellulitis or so any features of infection, you don't want to be passing a, a, a superior catheter through that. And then finally, my final contraindication would be being an F1. If someone suggests, can you please go and place an SPC? The answer is no, not even your F2 or even your SHO should be doing this. This is a registrar job. If you trouble, if you're having trouble placing a urethral catheter, talk to the SHO and reg. Do not place an SPC by yourself. Do not be pushed into it or tempted. So we've got the catheter in, it's working, it's doing its job, and it comes to removal of the catheter. Most people will have their catheter removed before they're discharged from hospital, but some people will fail the removal of the catheter. Um, and therefore what we would consider doing for a man who, for example, has had an acute episode of retention or he had to have an elective operation, needed a catheter, we took the catheter out and he was now unable to pass urine as a result. We return the catheter, replace it, give them a two week course of tamsulosin because this will work to relax the prostate. And so when it comes to having the catheter removed two weeks later, um, the prostate is nice and relaxed and you've increased the, the channel that they can pass urine through, through the urethra is much wider and therefore you increase their chance of passing um, catheter removal. Some reasons and times when you do not clock is if a patient has had high pressure retention. I'm sure you're all aware that your retention can be classed as low pressure or high pressure. Low pressure is essentially when you have the absence of an acute kidney injury, hydronephrosis, and they typically have less than a thousand mils drained from their bladder. If the patient has any features of high pressure retention, so when they come in with their episode of retention, they've either got a renal impairment, they've got hydronephrosis on their ultrasound scan, or they've drained a large volume, you are not to remove this catheter because the catheter is the only thing that is safeguarding their kidneys and allowing the bladder to be drained. Because if you have a look at this picture, so this is your normal bladder with your ureters and your kidneys. When you have high pressure retention, the bladder becomes so distended, it's no longer elastic. It becomes essentially like a, a taut drum and it can't stretch anymore to allow more urine to fill up in the bladder. And therefore you get a back pressure up into the ureters, which presses all the way back up into the kidney. So you can see here the ureters are much dilated and you end up developing hydronephrosis and renal impairment. By placing a catheter, you have bypassed the obstruction, so the prostate is causing the blockage, and therefore all of the urine can drain, the kidneys can recover, and the hydronephrosis settles. If you then take this person's catheter out, they are simply going to return to um, high pressure retention, and they could go into you know, acute renal failure. The other alternative for a patient who has high pressure retention is either long-term catheterization, or they can have an operation on their prostate, such as a TURP, so a transurethral resection of the prostate. But again, that would only be done once they've had a period of catheterization to allow their kidney function to improve. Um, and the catheter remains in until the day of the operation. So there's no time period between retention and the operation without a catheter. That catheter has to stay in. Right. So back to the foreskin. Um, so we talked about you'll be retracting the foreskin be able to clean the glands appropriately and properly before you place the catheter. If you don't replace it afterwards, you'll end up with a paraphimosis. And this is where you have the foreskin retracted back behind the glands and it then becomes very edematous and you can develop this thick band of edema, which effectively constricts the distal penis and the glands and you can almost get 
an ischemia and a compartment syndrome of the distal glands. Okay, so replace that full skin would be my first comment. But if you get called by the nurses and they say, or somebody else, and they say, you know, we've got this patient, he's been catheterized, he's got a very sore penis, we think he's got a paraphimosis, we can't get the foreskin back. There's a couple of things that you can try and do before calling somebody senior. So the first thing that you need to do, and this is dependent on how compliant the patient is and how comfortable and how well they're tolerating it, you effectively need to squeeze the penis so that you squeeze that band of edema if you squeeze it for five minutes the edema will go out and the foreskin will be able to be replaced because you've reduced that that ring of edema that said sometimes it's very painful um, and they won't tolerate it and in which case you'll need to get your SHO or registrar to come along and perform a penile block so the penis is nice and numb and then you'll be asked to squeeze it for five minutes while the edema goes down sometimes people place um wet gauze that have been soaked in a glucogel to act as an osmotic agent to try and draw the edema out personally i think that is not particularly effective the best thing to do is to get the patient comfortable either because they already are or with the penile block and you just need to stand there and squeeze and work on your small talk so that you can make things less awkward once that has been done and you've reduced the edema either the foreskin will come back over the glands if not the bottom image here is something that you can also gently try to do. So effectively, you take your finger and thumb and you push the glands back while pulling the foreskin up. And hopefully that will come back over and you will push the glands back in and it will be covered by foreskin. OK, so. That's kind of your main issues that you're going to see on the ward. So catheters are going to be the bane of your lives and patients with hematuria. So managing three-way catheters, irrigation, um, and talking patients as well. If you're doing a urological job or a surgical job, you're going to be exposed to certain urological procedures and investigations. And given there's such limited exposure in the undergraduate curriculum, I'm just going to go through the common procedures that will be um, ordering for patients. So the nephrostomy. I'm sure you're familiar with this. Essentially, it's an interventional guided an interventional radiology procedure performed under local anaesthetic. Patient goes down to interventional radiology under local anaesthetic where they have a small bleb of local anaesthetic over the flank. A drainage tube is essentially passed through the skin and it sits coiled in the renal pelvis so it doesn't travel all the way down to the bladder um, and it allows the urine to drain. So that's your simple nephrostomy. And then we have something called a nephrostogram. And so if you want to see if urine is able to drain from the renal pelvis down into the bladder, what they will do is you'll organise a nephrostogram and contrast medium, so a contrast dye, will be injected into the nephrostomy and they will take serial x-rays to see if that contrast trickles all the way down to the bladder and you would see the bladder fill with some contrast. If there is either a tumour in the ureter or there's extrinsic compression due to an abscess around there or other kind of um, mass mass effect you will see some contrast getting halfway down and then it will have a cutoff point or you may have an, a stricture within your ureter as well and so your nephrostogram gives you a good idea of whether you've got opacity and whether you've got full drainage down to the bladder or whether the nephrostomy needs to stay to keep the kidney safe and drained so that's what a nephrostogram looks like when you are asked to order one and and then ureteric stent so your ureteric stent is a soft um it's plastic it's essentially the same dimensions as a piece of cooked spaghetti i would say and it is placed from the renal pelvis down into the bladder and essentially it acts like a drain pipe cleaner and allows urine to drain down the middle of it but also around the outside of it so if there's any blockage within your ureter either because of a cancer because of a kidney stone or a ureteric stone this will effectively allow urine to drain from the kidney down into the bladder now there's two ways of placing stents it's either an anti-grade stent or a retrograde stent. You'll hear these words banded around quite a lot. But your anti-grade stent is anti-grade in the respect of it's going forward. So it goes from kidney to bladder. So your patient will have their nephrostomy in and then you would ask for a nephrostogram. If it's patent all the way down, you will then get an anti-grade stent placed. It will be pushed through the... Um, nephrostomy essentially and down into the bladder and then the nephrostomy will be removed. The other way of placing a stent is retrograde so from bladder back up to kidney. This is an operation so you have a patient has a general anaesthetic and it's all um, an endoscopic procedure so a cystoscope goes into the bladder and then you use guide wires to pass the stent all the way up into the kidney and you leave a cord in the bladder. So if you're asked to 
a range stenting or um, anti-grade or retrograde stenting, that just gives you an understanding of that. So moving on to acute testicular pain, I'm only going to go through this briefly, but you may get called to a patient who has, you know, acute onset testicular pain either in the ward or in A&E, and you just need to have um, some differential diagnosis and know when to escalate it up to your seniors. So the first thing that you should all be thinking is, is this a torsion? So this is our acute urological emergency, and this would need to be surgically resolved within six hours. We still do it up to around 24 hours, and so there are still good salvage rates, but ideally you need to get on and get this sorted out. So worry about a torsion. The history will be an acute onset. It will be unilateral. They may have some nausea and have had some vomiting. There's no particular history of trauma, though some people say it can be associated with, you know, um, traumas to the scrotum, but it is just a spontaneous um, event. Ask about family history, because if patients have a bell clapper deformity where the testicles lie slightly more horizontally than vertically, they're more prone to swinging and twisting. So if family members have also had this, then that could be um, something to worry about. When you examine the patient, you want to examine the abdomen, make sure there's no other um, causes of abdominal or testicular pain. You want to examine the hernial orifices, and then when you come onto the testicle itself, you'll examine the testicle. It may feel bulky because it's been swollen and edematous because it's been infarcted for so long. You would want to look at skin that's overlying it. Is it um, does it look like it's infected, which may point you towards an epididymitis? And then you want to assess for the cremasteric reflex as well, which is when you would stroke their inner thigh. So you want to make sure you've explained the, the reflex that you're eliciting to the patient. And so when you stroke kind of briskly with your finger, their inner thigh on the same side, that it's the, the ipsilateral side of the scrotum will elevate because you've elicited the cremasteric reflex. It's not always um, absent or present in a torsion, but it can help build a clinical picture. So thinking about a torsion, not to think about other scrotal pathologies that may be the cause of testicular pain. Have they got a torted hydatus? So this is when you have an appendage of the testis, which is a um, developmental remnant, essentially. It's a bit like the appendix of the bowel, and this itself can twist. When you examine the patient, if you shine a light on the scrotum, they will have a very similar history to a testicular torsion because it's the same physiological event but it's just on a tiny appendage as opposed to the entire scrotum so it'll be sudden onset a short history generally and acute testicular pain not especially radiating elsewhere and there'll be no other symptoms such as lower urinary tract symptoms features of the infection when you examine the testicle they may have pinpoint tenderness rather than a globally tender testicle and we talk about a blue dot sign so when you look at the testicle the whole testicle will be nice and the scrotum will be nice and pale, but then there'll be a blue dot where that small area of necrosis or infarct has occurred. You can manage this conservatively if you can confidently diagnose it as a uh, twisted appendage. The ability to diagnose that and differentiate that from a testicular torsion is pretty poor. And so these patients generally will be, generally be taken to theatre for a scrotal expiration because you need to ensure that this isn't a twisted testicle that you're mislabeling as a twisted appendage. Um, so that's something else you need to be thinking about. And then other scrotal pathologies are your epididymal orchitis. So is this actually an infection? So there's no need for scrotal expiration. Have they had a history of sexually transmitted infection, unprotected sex? penile discharge, any fevers, rigors, have they had um, swelling in the testes, um, pain when passing urine, and have they had a history of epididymal colitis in the past? If you go to examine the patient, um, they've got a red, hot, swollen, hemiscrotum. The testicle is often slightly less tender when you lift it because the lifting alleviates the, um, the pain associated with the inflammation. That may be a sign, so that's called your friend sign. Um, and if you're querying infection, the thing that you need to be thinking about is, is this potentially a Fournier's gangrene? So when you assess a patient from epididymal orchitis, I would always lift the scrotum up as high as you can, have a look all the way underneath it, look on the inner thighs, the groin creases, make sure that all of the skin is pristine and viable and healthy. It can be red and angry, but there must be no black um, necrotic areas. And I would always do a rectal examination because you want to ensure this hasn't spread from a prostatic abscess. So feel the prostate. Does it feel boggy? Does it feel very, very tender? If they've got a prostatic abscess, they will be jumping off the bed when you do that. Um, and you also want to assess the perineal area because actually, if this is a Fournier's gangrene, have they had a perineal abscess which has spread um, anteriorly and resulted in the Fourniers? 
And then finally, somebody presenting with acute testicular pain, though rarely it could be that they've got a tumour. And so if you're going to take them to theatre and they're going to be explored because they've got a possible torsion, you'll obviously see if there's a tumour at that time. For all of your patients that come in with epididymorchitis or patients in the ward, they must get an ultrasound scan in the week you know, after the presentation because around 10% of patients with epididymorchitis also have an underlying um, testicular tumour. And so you need to rule that out essentially. In all of um, testicular pains, this is something I think as junior, you know, very junior doctors, you should be escalating up because you don't want to be the person that rings up your SHL or your registrar after six hours of trying to treat it with painkillers on the ward. Is this a torsion? Isn't it a torsion? And then you call your registrar and by the time you've called them, the testicle is dead. So if there's any concern about testicular pain or scrotal pain, get people involved early in early doors they'd much rather come and see the patient and say no it's not a torsion that's fine carry on or if there's any query they'll be taking them to theatre we have a low threshold to take patients to theatre to explore them um, and then finally they could have a varicocele which is dilated veins that drain the testes and um, when you examine them it's typically called a bag of worms appearance so you can feel it it feels rubbery they are easily palpated and people will report that they have, you know, a dull throbbing in the scrotum often at the end of a day when they've been standing. It's very similar to varicose veins of the lower limbs, which often pregnant women or people with um, pelvic malignancies and therefore they have reduced venous return from the lower limbs will report into a similar issue. So it's not a testicular pain as such. It's um, a dull throbbing ache of the hemiscrotum itself. And then you also need to think about non-scrotal causes of scrotal pain. So have they actually got an inguinal scrotal hernia? So when you go and examine any of these patients, you need to be examining their hernial orifices, ask them to cough, ask them to stand. Is there a swelling that is going down into the scrotum? Can you reduce it? And if there's any query that you've got a hernia or possibly you can't reduce it and it's very tender, you need to be phoning the general surgical uh, team to ask them to come and review because is this an incarcerated or an obstructed hernia? And then finally, is this referred pain? So actually, does this patient present with testicular pain because that's what they feel but it's all referred pain from a ureteric colic so often you should you should always dip these patients urine because if there's blood or signs of infection and um, this could be a, a, a colic rather than a, a primary testicular pathology and therefore they need to get imaging to rule out any stones that are causing the pain so finally is renal colic and i'm just going to touch on this very briefly so you are in A&E or you're on the wards and there's a query that a patient has a kidney stone or a ureteric stone. They've come in with a short history, a long history of kind of colic, loin to groin pain. You're fairly convinced that this is a colic and it's a stone pain. Um, and you ring your, you know, you refer to the urologist, you say, I've got a patient with a query colic, can you accept them? The answer will always be no. Urologists do not accept stone patients or colic patients until it's proven. On imaging and that imaging needs to be a plain CTKUB and the reason is is there is a worry that we could be missing much more serious other pathology so the, the classic example is that if somebody comes in with a couple of days of lower abdominal and back pain loin to groin pain and they're a little bit unwell sent to the you know the urologist as a colic and it turns out that actually they've got a leaking AAA which has been causing issues for the last couple of days they've got retroperitoneal irritation because obviously your A also sits in the retroperitoneum and so you have a very similar pattern and that's why a patient always needs to be imaged before you refer them as a colic you need to make the diagnosis it's not a case of referring them and then making the diagnosis um, so you can see here this is a coronal section of a plain CTKUB there's no contrast when you look in the, the the major vessels in the aorta and the IVC in the center. And you can see there's a calcification there, which would be your, um, your proximal ureteric stone. When you've got a patient with colic, there's some considerations that you need to keep in the forefront of your mind. These are the kind of four key defining features which will guide how you manage this patient acutely. Is there any renal impairment? If there's renal impairment, they're not going home, they're staying in and they need to be referred to urology. This isn't a case where you can let them go home and be managed because if that kidney stone or the ureteric stone is blocking the kidney and they've already developed an AKI, they can't be sent home, they need to be deobstructed. Secondly, are they septic? Is this an infected obstructed kidney? And in which case they need to have urgent decompression as well. So you therefore always get a CRP always get a urine dip, look for nitrites, look for leukocytes. Nitrites are the main indicator here. Often in A&E, they're not keen to do CRPs and I will always request that the A&E team perform a CRP on this patient. Because if you've got somebody who's come in with colic 
they've got slightly raised white cells because you know you've got the diagnosis of colic they've got white cells of 14 this may be due to inflammation and um, they've not got any temperature the pain is well controlled you think you may be able to send them home you need to get that crp because if it comes back high this is an infected obstructive system and you can't attribute the raised white cells to purely and um, being the inflammation of the stone passage and they need to be admitted so be strict on getting your crp if this pain is persistent, so if the colic pain can't be managed, even in the absence of renal impairment and sepsis, the patient needs to be admitted and be um, decompressed for pain relief. And then finally, you would admit or you'd have a, have a much lower threshold for treating these patients if they have a solitary kidney. If they have two working kidneys and one of them has a stone that's going to take a couple of weeks to pass spontaneously in at home that's fine if this is their only kidney and anything goes wrong with that stone it becomes infected once they're at home they've lost it they're either heading for a life dialysis or renal transplant so solitary tick kidneys need to be taken much more seriously when you're dealing with stones with regards to them finally when you've got your um, you've got your ct scan it's proven stones you need to take an a to e assessment of them so you need to work through your you know your thorough management work them up stabilize them give them intravenous antibiotics we typically give gentamicin and kermoxiclav to cover for urosepsis be sure that their renal function hasn't been knocked off so severely by an obstructing stone that they can have gentamicin um, and i would always advocate placing a catheter in a patient with an infected obstructed system what you're worried about is renal function in this situation and then potentially becoming very unwell. And so you need to be knowing exactly what the contralateral kidney is still doing. And then finally, they need to be decompressed. So this can either be done by a nephrostomy, as we mentioned previously, or it can be done by a retrograde stent or a general anaesthetic. There's a couple of factors that will um, guide why, whether you choose nephrostomy or retrograde stenting. So if the patient is so sick that they're you know, hemodynamically unstable, they're probably heading to intensive care because these patients can come in very unwell. And a frostomy well, may well be a preferred choice because it um, doesn't require a general anaesthetic, which is going to drop their blood pressure further. They can have a local anaesthetic. It's a quicker procedure. Um, and they, yes, it avoids general anaesthetic and you get the same immediate drainage. Equally, anti-grade stent or retrograde stenting under general anaesthetic may be beneficial if this is a patient who's morbidly obese, so they've got a very long um, distance from the kidney to the skin. It might not be physically possible to place an aphrostomy. If they've got a coagulopathy as well, that's going to be an absolute contraindication. Again, you're not wanting to pass large tubes and needles through such a highly vascular structure, and in those situations, you would go for a retrograde stent. And then finally, just for definitive management of stones so either ureteric or renal stones if this is your patient who's well so they've not got renal impairment they're not septic their pain is controlled they can be discharged home and they have three options to how we manage ureteric stones so first of all they can try conservative management if a stone is less than seven millimeters it's got around 70 to 80 percent chance of passing spontaneously over the next six weeks we would follow them up in clinic with serial ct scans to ensure that the stone passes by itself you can offer them tamagulosin, which acts in the same way as on the prostate, so it relaxes the smooth muscle and will allow the stone to pass more easily down the ureter and open it up so it increases the chance of passage. The other two options are PSWL, so that's extracorporeal shock with lithotripsy. It's an outpatient procedure, it's performed under no sedation, no anaesthetic. And essentially you lie the patient on a bed, you use x-ray to focus on the stone, and you simply use shock waves fired onto the stone to break them up. And then as you can see in the second image on the right hand side, these small fragments can then pass spontaneously down the ureter and people will pass them out in their urine. And then the final option is a ureteroscopy. So it's a general anesthetic procedure, so it's an operation. And essentially we pass a ureteroscope up into the bladder all the way up to the stone and um, use lasers, break the stones up, fragment it into dust that can then be passed spontaneously. Um, or we can use baskets to drink, bring the stone fragments out of the ureter into the bladder and then outside. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much for listening. And I think there'll be some questions now. If you wouldn't mind also filling in um, a feedback form, I think if you scan this QR code, that should take you to a link. Thank you, thank you, Louise. Yes, if everyone could complete the feedback form for Louise, who's come and kindly done this post nights and pre birthday on call, <laughs> we have a few questions that have come in. Okay, um, is a JJ stent and a ureteric stent the same thing? Yes, 
it is. So a JJ stent is the other word for a ureteric stent. So all ureteric stents, the reason it's called JJ is if I can go back through the images, it's not, ah, here we go. The blue stent on the left hand side, if you can convince yourself that it looks like two J's that are put together, so they've got the curly ends and those stop the stent migrating out of the renal pelvis and the bladder, so it should stay put. Um, and yeah, so a JJ stent is a ureteric stent and it kind of looks like two J's with curly ends. Great. Um, do you offer tamsulosin to females for kidney stones? Yes, absolutely. So at the moment, there is some. Um, controversy with the evidence with regards to the efficacy of tamsulosin but at the moment the evidence shows there is a degree of benefit so if you have a small so a less than 10 millimeter distal ureteric stone we would offer the patients tamsulosin as it can increase passage of the stone but you also need to be conscious of potential contraindications which are mainly low blood pressure so if a patient you know already has problems with blood pressure it's going to drop their blood pressure further and the other side effect um, you want to counsel a male with on tamsulosin is that they will experience retrograde ejaculation so dry ejaculation because when they orgasm they will have a kind of a relaxed prostate and so the ejaculate will go back up into the bladder rather than coming out as it normally would oh great thank you do you want to go back to the feedback form so some people can fill it in oh um, sure. as we're speaking there's also a link if anyone needs um quite a useful one for the practical side of what we're doing if a catheter is blocked are there yeah. tips you have to unblock it before you try and replace it yeah so what you can try and do is take your bladder syringe first of all and see if there's anything that's blocking it so what's draining is it that they've had clear urine and now they've got hematuria draining in which case you may need to replace the catheter with a large three-way because they can develop hematuria after a catheter is placed um, i would take a 50 mil bladder syringe and i would you know, in, um, flush the bladder with that. Is there any debris? Is there any clot or anything that's sat on the end of the, the bladder, which is uh, the catheter, which is not allowing it to drain? And then what you can do is you can deflate the balloon um, completely. So have a look back, see what has been inflated into the balloon. It should be 10 mils. And then you can push the catheter all the way up to the hilt to make sure it hasn't slipped back into the prostatic fossa that it truly is in the catheter and um, in the bladder. And then you can reinflate and hopefully that will recite it better for you. Great. Um, someone's asking, do we use normal saline or sterile water when we're inflating the catheter balloon? Yeah, so good question. And I think I said normal saline, which is wrong. It's always sterile water. If you were to use saline, the, um, the salts can precipitate out and then you can get kind of osmotic changes and the, the balloon can sometimes pop. So always sterile water into the balloon. Um, and your advice for the best way to treat staghorn calculus? So that depends on the patient. So when you're treating renal stones, so ureteric strains need to be removed because they will cause obstruction. Renal stones are dependent on the stone and also on the patient. So if you have a young 25 year old female with a large staghorn calculus and as a result of her staghorn calculus is she has recurrent urinary tract infection, you want to get her stone free. Typically for a large staghorn or a complex staghorn, which means the stag is essentially, it's got multiple prongs going into various calcula rather than just one stone. Um, they would undergo a PCNL, so a percutaneous nephrolithotomy, which is general anaesthetic when you puncture into the back and you have direct access into the kidney. That said, if you've got a 85 year old frail person who has a staghorn, it's possibly an incidental finding. They're not played with urinary tract infections. You know, PCNL, they could have a huge septic shower afterwards, a major bleed if the kidney is um, injured, that's going to, you know, have potential major morbidity issues for them. You may well leave it well alone or just monitor it with serial imaging. Okay. Um, what if the catheter is inserted in the wrong place and you irrigate the wrong area? As in, it's sat in the urethra or the prostate. I think so, yeah. Yep, so that shouldn't cause a problem. So if the irrigation is just running into the, the prostate or to the urethra, it will go up to the bladder and then it will drain back down. The bigger concern is that you've, if to have started irrigation, you probably will have inflated the balloon. And so that balloon is sat, um, you know, applying pressure to the urethra or the prostate. So I wouldn't be, you know, the irrigation itself will just go up, will gently, it will go, it will go through the part of least resistance up into the bladder and then drain back down again. But the concern is that the bladder, the catheter is in the wrong place rather than the irrigation. So I think our last question, just because, as you said, you don't get a lot of exposure to urology yeah. um, for people tuning in. Any tips for the pathway for, you know, if you want to specialise in urology? 
Yes. Um, thank you for the great lecture. Oh, you're welcome. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you could, if you don't have a urology job during your foundation years, you can do a taste a week. So definitely go and do a week to understand what it's all about. There's so many different types of surgery within the urology subspecialty. So you've got endoscopic, open, laparoscopic, robotic, pediatric. You want to go and see what it actually entails. Um, try and get a job in your foundation years but then when you do your core surgical training a lot of programs these days will be flexible so they're not completely themed and i personally think it's quite good to have a non-themed job so some jobs will be 18 months of the specialty you think you want to do but actually having the flexibility to do other specialties um is is useful so yeah try and get a, a foundation job do a taste a week and um, there's a lot of we try to recruit people to urology because it's not a very well known topic and not wherever I'm subjects there's lots of courses that are put on for medical students and junior doctors so if you get to your local deanery I'm sure there'll be courses going that will give you a taster into urology. Okay great thank you so much for joining us today Louise and if everyone could just follow the link for the feedback form because we all really appreciate it and we will see you all next week. Thanks Louise. Bye.